Tonight, we're going to hear a topic, Joe Lincoln. And the fellow who's going to be talking about Joe Lincoln is Jim Coogan. Now, many of you know Jim, but for the few that do not, Jim is a Cape Cod guy, born and raised here. Uh, he has been a columnist for the Cape Cod Times, recently left that position after many years of doing that. And prior to that, he was a full-time teacher and history teacher right here on the Cape. He's an author, he has a number of publications out, some of which are right here on the stage tonight, and I'm sure Jim will allude to them. So, without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to my friend and colleague, Jim Coogan. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I have to make a couple of corrections right away. I have to tell you that I'm not a Cape Codder. I was not born on this side of the canal. And um, maybe hold the lights a few minutes here. Just, okay, good. Yeah, I, I've been here since I was four. And uh, that creates problems because uh, I can't claim the pedigree of the sacred soil here. I always tell the story, my father and mother, they came from Boston, and uh, my father was an Irishman who grew up in Roxbury and then spent a good part of his pre-married life in Dorchester. So when they came down to the Cape in 1948, uh, my father um, went to the town hall, and there was an old Yankee there, uh, Alpheus Percy Newcomb. He was the town clerk and had been the town clerk since the 1920s. And my father said, uh, I'm here to register to vote. And so Newcomb said, what are you going to be? And he, my father says, a Democrat. Well, he almost fell off the chair. <laughs> he said, there hasn't been a Democrat come through here to vote since the priest had a mitch in here in 1928. <laughs> so uh, we, were, we were kind of outnumbered growing up in uh, the town of Brewster. And um, I was very lucky in growing up in a small town. I, I don't think I. I ever, um, I don't think I ever realized just how much I had going for me in, in a small town of about 800 people on Cape Cod, and only as I've aged have I realized, you know, just what a wonderful experience it was. The other thing I want to mention that these are not my books up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are books by Joe Lincoln, and the reason they're there is that they're there for you to take after the program. Uh, my wife and I do a lot of collecting, and we have the complete set of uh, the Joseph C. Lincoln. There are over 40-some-odd uh, novels. We have them all. So when I'm in a used bookstore and I see one, I grab it. And I have lots of extras, so I hope that you will take. Uh, I don't want to have to carry them home again, so uh, they're theirs for you to take. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our subject before I go to the slides. Um, Joseph Crosby Lincoln uh, was by far the Cape's most prolific author. Uh, he wrote, as I said, over 40 novels. Um, he was syndicated in magazines like the Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, Harper's Bazaar, Ladies Home Journal. Uh, he sold in his time over two million books. Uh, he wrote plays. He had several movies made of his uh, books, and he was really a very well-known author in the early part of the 20th century. Sadly, uh, his, his whole uh, memory is pretty much gone. Uh, people, uh, if I were to ask any group 
probably this one as well, if we were not here for the lecture, and I said, uh, Who do, you, do you know anything about Joe Lincoln? I'd see very few hands. And in some ways, it's kind of sad, because I recommend that uh, if it's a rainy day, if you've maybe not had all the good things happen to you that day or that week, and you're feeling a bit down, I think you should read a Joe Lincoln book. Because Joe Lincoln, uh, he never made any apologies for it. He was the master of the happy ending. He was a writer who um, established um, the good guys and the bad guys in the first chapter, and you knew in the first chapter that the bad guy was going to get his comeuppance at the end. It's interesting that uh, one of his contemporaries, Eugene O'Neill, was writing about dark tales and the insane. Lincoln, on the other hand, was writing um, bright, sunny pieces, obviously talking about some of the quirky idiosyncrasies of Cape Codders, but I don't think he ever labeled them or wanted them to be seen as insane. Well, we have a slide program to go through, and so I think we can um, get the slides, and if everything works as it's supposed to, we'll have one. All right, I kind of hope that looks good. It's kind of a hard angle for me here, but we can see um, this is the title of the program. He's, the reference to the Bard of Cape Cod comes from a 1940 celebration of uh, Lincoln as an adult writer, which took place in the Statler Hilton in Boston. Uh, Governor Saltonstall, Leverett, Leverett Saltonstall was there at the time. Uh, a number of his uh, contemporaries, some of the writers of the day that were well known were there, and they praised Lincoln as a writer who captured the common man, who was the champion of the rural life, and who wrote about um, what would be called the positive values of human nature. It's a fact that Lincoln was so popular and his works were generally, and I'd say almost universally, loved by people who wanted uh, a positive look at human nature, that uh, a lot of his books were given to uh, children who had perfect attendance at Sunday school. So um, his, his uh, popularity really stretched across not only the age limits from young to old, but uh, even though he was a regional author, and wrote strictly about Cape Cod, uh, his works were popular across the entire country. Well, when we think of Joe Lincoln, first of all, he was born five years after the Civil War, February of 1870, so he grew up in uh, what you'd almost call uh, a brigadoon sort of a, an existence, small town, uh, you know, just rural people, rural values, and the intrusion of outsiders was not something welcomed really by Lincoln or the rest of the people who lived on Cape Cod. I think uh, many of them saw the changes that were happening in the beginning of the 20th century, especially with new people coming in with new ideas. A lot of those people were seen as patronizing or condescending to the local people. And Lincoln picked up on that theme. And he would often write stories where the homespun wisdom of local people always trumped these people who came from away with their new ideas. So his Cape Cod was a very um, uh, a quiet rural setting. And his characters came from that setting. And it is true that before Patty Page sang the song about old Cape Cod, Joe Lincoln had already put it on the map with all of his novels. Joe, as I said, was born in February of 1870. Uh, he came from a seafaring family, as did many of the people who lived on Cape Cod. Certainly, the sea was the avenue for adventure and for commerce. And this was his house on Main Street in Brewster. Uh, the house was built around 1840, and his father, Captain uh, Joseph Lincoln, uh, was a sea captain. His grandfather, uh, who was Captain Isaac Lincoln, uh, was also a sea captain. 
And tragedy uh, followed the families in the form of people lost at sea. Isaac Lincoln, the grandfather, was lost with all hands on his ship. Uh, Joe's father uh, died on a voyage to Savannah, Georgia, only 10 months after Joe was born. So Captain Joe Lincoln died at uh, age 45, and he died in 1870, the same year that Joe was born. To the right of the stone for Captain Lincoln is uh, his first wife, Susan Payne Lincoln. And she, uh, as did many women from Cape Cod, accompanied her husband to sea, and unfortunately for her, the sea also took her life as she was washed overboard in a big storm off the Virginia Capes. And so he lost his first wife when he was about 27 years old, and he married again another person from Brewster, Emily Crosby. And Emily Crosby lived until 1897. Um, Again, the captain, the father of Joe Lincoln, died in 1870. So Joe um, grew up in a house that was dominated certainly by women, and he was very much influenced by women, and I find a strain in all of his novels where he, uh, he has women uh, very often to be the, the wisdom people in the plot. They're the ones who solve things. They're the ones who are level-headed, whereas very often uh, the men are undependable and not always um, up to the best of intentions. So Emily Crosby Lincoln was uh, very influential in Joe's life. And then growing up, uh, he lived in a house of women. He was an only child. And he was a lucky boy in so many ways, because these women really, uh, they took care of him, they nurtured him. Um, if you think of that little slogan about it takes a village, well, Joe's village was very supportive of him as, a, as an orphan, or as a, one who'd lost his father. So the women in Joe's life were very strong, and they show up in his novels. Brewster, in 1870, was a town that was hard by Cape Cod Bay, as it still is, but it was the home of many retired sea captains. And it was a relatively small village. There were actually five villages in Brewster at that time, but the, the, the dominant one was by the bay where the packet landing was. And um, it was very much as you'd see in a picture here with uh, the tall steeple of the Unitarian Church right in the center of town. The Baptist Church from 1824 was just up the street. And these were the kinds of views that would have influenced Joe's young life from age of birth to age 13. Now I say age 13 because at age 13, uh, his mother brought him to Chelsea, Massachusetts, where he was able to finish his education at least through the end of elementary school. He was out of school by age 15, never attended college. But he probably would not have gone that far in the very rudimentary uh, schooling that he would have had in Brewster. This is a picture of his uncle's store, Captain Warren Lincoln, uh, his father's brother. And um, here in a place like this is where Joe Lincoln began to accumulate the stories that would become part of all of the novels that he wrote. Because here, the old timers would sit around, they'd talk about their days at sea. There were so many retired sea captains. At one time, Brewster, with a population of less than 1,000 people, had over 130 master mariners, and that was a very large proportion of the population who were um, captains of ships. Now, by 1870, the age of sail was ending because steam, which had come out of the Civil War, coupled with a screw propeller, uh, made traveling uh, under sail uh, just not advantageous or swift. So a lot of the sea captains were retiring, and they had stories that Joe would just hang around uh, where they were playing cards or talking, and he would absorb these stories. And I think even at an early age, he had an interest in putting these stories down on paper. Um, 
he, even in school, uh, his teachers mentioned that he was one that uh, liked to be a writer. Uh, I don't think at that age, at early age, he had an intention to become a, a, a professional writer, but he enjoyed it. This was the Unitarian Church in the center of Brewster. Uh, he and his mother attended this regularly. It was only about a, maybe no, a quarter of a mile from the house where he lived. The, uh, the school he went to was less than a half a mile from where he lived, so he was right in the center of things. And the railroad station was probably about a mile from his house, maybe a mile and a half. Again, this was a place where a young boy could sit and watch all the old timers sitting around the spittoons talking about things. And uh, it is said that no one ever got off the railroad train in these small towns without, within 10 minutes, uh, the whole town knew that someone new had come and where they were going and why they were there. So Lincoln, uh, between the general store and also uh, the railroad depot and probably a church, uh, he picked up a lot of background about traditional Cape Cod. This was the ladies' library, which was built when he was only two years old. And he, uh, you know, began to take books out that, from that library uh, when he was eight, nine, and ten years old. Uh, that ladies' library still exists. It's much bigger than it was then, but... Um, this was only two houses from where Joe Lincoln lived. So again, the central nature of his location was perfect. The Brewster Town Hall, which uh, was built in 1881. Joe was 11 years old, so he saw that go up. And uh, it was the center of uh, you know, local government, and it was also where you know, you'd go and watch a, a minstrel show or a play on the stage on the second floor. So that's pretty much the view that Joe Lincoln would have had as a youngster before he and his mother left for Chelsea uh, up near the city. Close to Joe's house was also the, um, the harbor. Now Brewster's interesting in that it doesn't really have a harbor. Uh, they had to build an artificial harbor and the way they did it is they extended a, um, a pier from the shore out to what was like a, an L wharf, where they uh, dug actually down into the sand, because if you know Brewster, the tide goes out there and leaves you about a mile and a half of sand flat. So the packet boat from Boston would come in and it would tie up at the Brewster Pier, and then uh, when the tide went out, she'd settle right down into that little hole that they'd uh, dug for the, the vessel. This is typical of a packet boat, a two-masted schooner, or a sloop, a single master. And prior to 1860, anyway, this was really the way that people had to go to the city. Between 1860 and 65, a railroad line was extended down into Brewster. It was completed in 1865, and then there was steady and dependable uh, transportation from um, Brewster to the city. But prior to that, it was uh, the packet vessel, which was the key to getting to and from Boston. This is the main street of Brewster, taken during the time of Joe's life. If you know where the Brewster uh, Inn is, um, it used to be called the Considine House and the Woodshed Restaurant or the Woodshed Bar, that's it on the left. And so you're looking uh, east down Main Street of Brewster. So again, a very small town, um, a lot of local people worked still uh, digging clams and uh, selling bait to the schooners that would tie up uh, off the shore that were headed out to the Grand Banks, but it was a slow and quiet pace of life. This is the uh, area near the Brewster Herring Run. This is, uh, it was called Factory Village. And the building that is sort of dead center on the left side of the road is the um, Brewster Grist Mill, which was built in 1873. So Joe Lincoln was only um, three years old when that went up, and it's still there. <coughs> 
Well, I mentioned he went to Chelsea, he got a pretty good education there, and um, after he finished uh, the schooling that he had there, he, he went to work. He was essentially an errand boy for a bank for a period of time, and then he worked his way up to become a clerk, and he worked in a bank for a few years. Uh, wasn't a job he really liked, but he had to help his mother. His mother became a seamstress, and she needed to earn the money so that they could live in Chelsea. Again, a picture in Brewster in this period of time, um, the harvesting of fish from a fish weir. And in Brewster, the time goes out, as I said, and they could go out with a horse and wagon and get right into the trap and catch the uh, fish that had gotten caught when the tide came in. These are all local fellows. And so, you can see that they were interesting of their own, their own nature, the work that they did, and, and he was very interested in that. Well, as he grew into a young man uh, in 1897, I mentioned that his mother died. And at that same year, he married, and he married a gal by the name of Florence Sargent. And they were married in their lifetime for 47 years. At that point, he was very unhappy with the job he had. He had, for a time, uh, been given the job as being an assistant editor to uh, a magazine that was designed for bicyclists. And the, the, uh, the magazine was part of the League of American Wheelmen. The bicycle ma ma the, um, the mania of that period was, was really everyone wanted to ride bicycles. And so they had a pretty good circulation of uh, of magazines to the whole country. Now, Joe had seen himself for a while as being an illustrator. He actually had gone into a partnership with another young man and they opened a, an art shop, but they weren't successful. But one of the things that he did was um, he would write poetry to make the, um, make the pictures more interesting. And he found that people were more interested in the poetry than the, uh, the actual drawings that he did. So he and his wife had some decisions to make and they did make the one where they decided they would move to New York City. New York City was the center of, um, of all literary uh, endeavors and he and his wife decided that they would take a small flat in Brooklyn and he would work again in a day job Again, something like a clerk job, and he would write at night. And so um, that's what they did. In the second year that they were in, uh, in Brooklyn, um, they had their first and only child, a boy that they named Freeman, Freeman Lincoln. Joe remembered where he came from, and he remembered the small communities that were part of his growing up. Just because he was in Chelsea going to school didn't mean he didn't come back to Cape Cod. He was here in the summertime and um, he continued to maintain his relations uh, with his families, uh, the extended family in Brewster and Chatham. Uh, so those memories from his early days, whether it be Dennis Port in that period of time or the great metropolis of Hyannis which uh, probably was a mecca for all young people that wanted to kick their heels up. Well, he remembered all these, and they would become part of his uh, repertoire of storytelling. Um, as I mentioned, uh, his poetry is fairly simple. There are a lot of rhyming couplets. Nothing, uh, I think, it also characterizes his writing. There's nothing really profound or deep in the work that he did. Uh, I'll give you an example of one of his poems that he wrote about lifesavers, the ones who worked for the Coast Guard at that period, the life-saving service. Um, he's a rigger, a rower, a swimmer, a sailor, a doctor, an undertaker, and he's good at every one of them the same. And he risks his life for others in the quicksand and the breaker, and a thousand wives and mothers bless his name. He's an angel dressed in oilskins. He's a saint in a sou'wester. He's as plucky as they make him or ever can. He's a hero born and bred, but it hasn't swelled his head. 
and he's just the government hired man. So simple couplets um, really characterize a lot of his poetry. Uh, I particularly like poetry that he wrote for his, um, his grandchildren. He had later, Freeman, his son, had two daughters and he loved them. And I think um, it tells you a little about, about Lincoln, the character, and also his sense of humor uh, when you listen to some of the poetry that he wrote for his grandchildren. Let's see if I can dig one out here. Uh, probably not. <laughs> I'll have to let that one go for a minute. So, the Cape at the beginning of the 20th century, a pretty, uh, pretty rural area still, small population. The population was actually dropping on Cape Cod until it would reach its low point in the mid-1930s before it would begin to start to rise again. Now, Lincoln never um, named the places that he wrote about. Like his characters, which he called uh, composites, he never wanted to really single out a real person, nor did he want to set a plot in a real place. But you pretty much knew where he was talking about. This is, this is a map that shows places that he used in a number of his novels. You could certainly see that Orham, is right on the East Tam Orleans line, so Orham is easily discovered. Uh, True Met, no problem there. Truro, um, Harness, a combination of Dennis and Harwich, uh, and Ostable, which we, uh, we know today as Osterville. So he was careful, um, you know, he didn't really want to cast aspersions on some of the uh, local issues that were going on that were identifiable, but they were so thinly uh, drawn that a lot of people felt that they knew who he was talking about, and some didn't like it. Uh, I know that in his novel, A. Hall and Company, uh, it was a story about a local clam digger and who had shore rights and, and a, a person from away, uh, who had actually grown up on the Cape but had gone to Chicago and become a successful banker who wanted to buy up the waterfront. And the, only, the last guy who was a holdout was this clam digger. And there was quite a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a conflict between these two people who knew, the, knew each other when they were young, but the fellow had gone away to Chicago and became an important banker. Well, it was pretty clear that this was Samuel Nickerson um, who was president of the um, First National Bank of Chicago. He had come out of Chatham, and um, it was so thin that, you know, people, they kind of winked, and I don't know whether Samuel Nickerson had any offense about it, but uh, that was the kind of thing. He was close enough that people uh, said, oh, I know who that is, I know who that is. He never admitted it. He always said that they were composites and not intended to be real people. <laughs> I think when we think of Lincoln, we think of sea captains, and um, he picked out all of the um, all of the characteristics of the captains. Uh, they were strong characters, uh, but they also uh, were full of bluster in some cases. And you can imagine if you had a town that. Um, maybe had 30 or 40 sea captains that were all retired, what it would be like at town meeting. And uh, you know they all wanted to be uh, the ones in charge. Uh, they were stubborn. Uh, they had wisdom. Again, I think the women very often uh, put them in their place. But uh, Lincoln, as I said, was uh, in Brooklyn uh, writing at night uh, and his poetry was selling, but he wasn't making a lot of money from it. So he worked on his first novel and completed it in 1903. And that was about a sea captain. Actually, it was about three sea captains. The, um, the title of the book was Captain Eri. And Captain Eri was uh, a retired master mariner who lived in a boarding house. Actually, they lived in a bachelor house the three of them were trying to keep house. They weren't doing very well. And they hit on a scheme that they would put an ad in a newspaper. They would draw straws and advertise that they needed a wife. And one of them had to marry 
the woman, and they figured that the other two would sort of ride the coattails, and as she cleaned the house up and made everything neat, that they would get the benefit of it. Well, the story was that they, they a gal from Nantucket, a Mrs. Snow, uh, answered the ad and came to Brewster, or came to where they were, and uh, she was wise to them. She knew exactly how they were trying to play this game. And they went around and around on and eventually um, Captain Eri, who was probably the most uh, reticent in terms of wanting to marry anybody, he did fall for her and she wisely grabbed him. And I guess she did take care of the other two captains, but there was a lot of humor in there um, and a little bit of a plot twist. But Captain Eri was immediately a, a popular book and it appealed um, to uh, a, a readership that was looking for humor and perhaps uh, traditional values and maybe a nostalgia for the old days. And the book took off and it really made him as a novelist. Uh, with that book, he was able to uh, quit his day job and begin writing full time. And he began to produce a number of books not just a book of poetry, but actually novels. And he was able to move with uh, his wife Florence out of Brooklyn and over to Hackensack, New Jersey, where he could get to the city easily, but he was also in a much quieter environment. And he was able to, with the money from the first book, he was able to build a house in Hackensack. And he lived in Hackensack for a number of years, producing books, and uh, they became increasingly popular. To some degree, if you think about it, the reason that his popularity was strong in that period, that many, many people had grown up in the East, some from Cape Cod, but certainly from New England, and they had moved West. They'd moved West in the 1880s, 90s, early 20th century. And they were seeing the effects of the urban growth, the pollution, the crowdedness, the crime, uh, all of the things that went with um, the growth of cities in that period. And they looked to Lincoln as sort of a light of nostalgia, looking back to the, the good, strong Yankee values that were found in New England, and particularly with Lincoln on Cape Cod. And so you can see, in a way, why there was a, a vast appeal. And Lincoln, um, he capitalized on it. He didn't come from the school of what you might call the realist school of writers, the muckrakers, the people who wanted to expose the dark side of life. Lincoln, on the other hand, um, was an uplifting writer. Simple in some ways with his plots, but always dependable. He was one that you could look forward to and uh, read with a smile. And again, he made no bones about it. He was quoted as saying that the world is a hard place. There's a lot of sadness and uh, hardship. And he said, I don't intend to add to that with my books. So again, when I say you should pick up one of those Joe Lincoln books on a kind of a dark day for yourself, that's why I would want you to do that. His captains were kind. They adopted uh, orphan children. They sat around and gave wisdom to young lovers. They uh, rescued um, widows from bankruptcy. Uh, they had all these qualities that you know, we wish were all just part of um, you know, all of our lives, and Lincoln wrote them up. He wrote them uh, as they were, unvarnished, and uh, people just loved it because uh, they, they could see themselves in many ways in the characters that he wrote. He talked about traditional things. I mentioned the, um, the harvesting of fish and fish weirs, but the family tradition of harvesting cranberries. Uh, a social event as well as an economic event. So he had cranberry bog owners, he had weird trap fishermen, he had uh, uh, bankers who he called the big bugs who took over the town and tried to run the politics of the community. They were always foiled by usually a housekeeper who uh, had that kind of knowledge of how to put him in his place. And the characters that um, he, um, he developed, they were very much based on real characters that you know, we would probably all know or we would have known someone like them. He used a variety of illustrators, um, Wallace Morgan, Edward Kemble, Edmund Frederick, Harold um, Butterger, 
and they were essentially the Norman Rockwells of the earliest 20th century. None of them really became uh, as well known as Rockwell, but they were illustrators, and they did his, the cover of his books. But here is one cover, and there is a character that certainly he could have used as a model, Lawrence Doyle, a Brewster man, who I'm sure that he knew uh, when Lawrence was much younger. Other images of uh, the captain or the retired seamaster who, um, you know, who dominated local society and the local economy. They typified the simple life. Um, again, as I said, the times that he wrote were when people were relocating from the east and headed out to the Midwest, even the far west. And they remembered the small town life of their own early years and contrasted that with the bustle and hustle and the pressure of urban life. So in a lot of ways, Lincoln's books were an escape from that kind of reality. He always settled on one or two quirky characters. This fellow here is a Provincetown town crier. Um, he is one who reportedly in 1888 saw a sea serpent and it was written up in all the state papers. Actually, the story went uh, national. But his description of, this, of the uh, sea monster that he saw was um, he had a huge horn on the top of his head, eight feet high, and then he had four rows of razor-sharp teeth, and he also had um, appendages on both sides of his head, three on each side, one with red eyes, the other with green eyes, and they went up and down, and they smelled like sulfur. Well, he became quite famous with this story. Uh, I do think that he spent a little more time than he should have probably in one of the local gin mills in Provincetown. <laughs> so as a mature man, Lincoln was doing very well. He actually was, would write in the morning from nine and then quit at about noontime. He always wrote longhand. He never dictated anything. He would write it longhand and then hand it to someone who would type the manuscript. Um, and he was knocking out a book every year, and they were selling very, very well. So uh, he and Florence and Little Freeman were on their way to a good success. Each book seemed to uh, have more and more interest, and as I said, they were serialized in the, um, the popular magazines of that period, whether it be the Post or McClure's or Ladies Home Journal, uh, he just uh, was able to carve into that market and do very well. Um, whether it be uh, a local sea captain who opens an inn and brings people in from the city and either charges them too much or tricks them one way or another or tells them tall tales, he would always have the person who was local be able to um, have better wisdom than someone from off Cape. I particularly like Captain Dan's daughter, which uh, he set in the town of Trumet, and Captain Dan was a retired seat captain, and his, um, his wife, Serena, was a social climber, and in the summertime, when all the wealthy people would come to the big hotels on the outer Cape, like the Chequesset and Wellfleet, she wanted to be part of that social set. But they didn't really accept her because she was the wife of a sea captain and you know he ran a general store. They didn't have much in the way of social capital. But they got an inheritance and they all of a sudden came into great wealth. And so Serena wanted to move from Trumet to uh, Scarsdale, New York. And there she got in there and you know, she joined the local ladies' society. But even there she was not accepted. And it, was, it took her daughter, Gertrude, who really had the wisdom to kind of let Serena down softly to point out the real, the real love of life was in a rural small town like Trumet. And they went back and they were happy ever after. But uh, that's a good story and some good lessons in there. Again, um, the, uh, the wisdom seemed to come from the working class 
whether it be the caretaker of the property or often the housekeeper. Um, and whatever crisis was happening, the housekeeper or the caretaker could put their heads together and figure out how to solve it so that the, the uh, principal characters never really realized that they were being led in the right direction, but it was the behind the scenes work of the common people. One thing that I mentioned uh, is that, again, Lincoln showed a strong strain of women uh, who really seemed to be the, the, strength, the strength characters in most of, many of his novels. And the men were just tongue-tied. It just seemed like they could, they, in any kind of a romantic situation, they could not utter the words that they loved someone, or they, they just, you know, they'd get close to asking someone to marry, and then they'd get cold feet and they'd go away. He had very weak men in many cases, and sometimes the women had to take things in their own hands and you know propose themselves. Um, but that was, I think, from his background of being raised uh, by women and strong women. Well, by 1916, he'd uh, done about you know nine different novels that had sold very well. He had some good money. In one letter I saw that he wrote to his son, um, the proceeds from one of the movies that he, uh, the movies that came from one of his novels, netted him $18,000. Now, the beginning of the 20th century, that's some pretty good money. So he had a house built on Shore Road in Chatham, which still stands. He called it Cross Trees, and it's sort of a shingle-style house that overlooks Aunt Lydia's Cove, Chatham Harbor. Uh, it's a beautiful spot, and this is where he would spend his summers from 1916 till his death in 1944. This is what the house pretty much looks like today. It's still a, a lovely house. Um, so they came here in the summer. He loved to play golf. He was a golfer at um, um, Eastwood Hope Country Club. He never learned to drive. He had a chauffeur that took him everywhere. I talked to an old fellow in Chatham a few years ago, Joe Nickerson, who's now passed away, but Joe was a youngster, and you know, on the Saturday movies, um, they had to wait until Joe came in the limousine before they showed the movie, and he said, we hated Joe. He said, we only had to wait until he got there. The chauffeur took him in. So um, he could be seen um, playing golf or fishing. And I mentioned a couple of illustrators that did some of his early books when he was writing for the Burt Company. Uh, later, he settled in to work almost exclusively with a, an artist that also lived in Chatham, and that would be Harold Brett. After 1915, um, the Brett illustrations kind of set the tone for Lincoln's books. And Brett was about 10 years younger than Lincoln, uh, but they became great friends, and uh, they, they collaborated a lot on covers that kind of set the tone for the novel. He also uh, could be a pretty good historian, and um, Lincoln was very familiar with the lifesavers that were there in Chatham, uh, down toward Monomoy. There was the old harbor station, and uh, he obviously spent time talking to the lifesavers. And when you read the book Rugged Water, you'll see that um, he captures the danger of going out into the surf with a surf boat to rescue sailors that were hung up on a sandbar in a January storm. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good source of history that I've found that I feel is quite accurate as to how it was. This is the old harbor station. Uh, I hope it is. No, it's the Wood End station. But it's typical of the um, stations that were every eight miles or so there'd be a, a station the beach was patrolled by lifesavers or people who watched the shore for about 10 months out of the year. The only months they didn't work was July and August. So there'd be maybe a crew of 10 fellows in here, all skilled in small boat techniques, and uh, they would launch their boats into the surf and rescue stranded sailors at, on, a, on a wreck offshore. But Lincoln really captured it very well. And I do think even as a fiction writer, his work can be depended on in the, uh, the true history sense. 
Once again, uh, in that story, Rugged Water, the, the lifesaver was very brave and he could rescue people and he went into cold water, but he couldn't propose to his girlfriend. <laughs> I think finally she said, listen, it's time, and he did. So Lincoln continued to write. I think most people say that um, he reached his peak around the mid-1920s and then um, sort of leveled off. But he did, um, he did uh, sell uh, two million books. And uh, that you know, really is, is something that is astounding to me. And he was very comfortable living summers in Chatham and then his family, uh, he and his wife, actually uh, Freeman and his wife bought a house just outside of uh, Philadelphia. And Joe and his wife moved down to the same area. They actually had adjacent lots in Villanova, uh, outside of Pennsylvania. And then he started, uh, he discovered, like many Cape Codders, that uh, it's nice to go to Florida in the wintertime. And so he began to spend winters in Winter Haven, Florida. This is a cover by Harold Brett, and it comes from the book Christmas Days. Again, it's a, it's a nice book. I enjoyed Christmas Days. It tells the story of two brothers uh, who, before the Civil War, were growing into uh, teenagers, and they were in love with the same girl. And the one who thought he was going to get the girl didn't get it, and he was very resentful of losing the girl. His brother ended up marrying her, and they were on the outs for some period of time. And Lincoln kind of develops the story through the Civil War, where the brother who did marry uh, the girl became a, a naval officer and was away from home a lot. And the other fellow became a clipper ship captain, and he was all around the world very successful. But there is an event that brings them both together, and that's a hallmark of Lincoln, having the, the two uh, antagonists see a common interest or find something that will bring them together to bring the story to a happy ending. The thing that's interesting to me is that the Brett cover is pretty clearly in the back, a nice colonial building, and I'm quite sure that Lincoln took him to the Elijah Cobb house in Brewster and said, this is what I want on the cover. And today, the Elijah Cobb house is the new headquarters of the Brewster Historical Society. So the building is very similar. And I think uh, that is, shows you, I think, the collaboration between Harold Brett uh, and Joe Lincoln on setting a tone with a cover and illustrations for his books, his novels. Well, Lincoln worried as he got into his 60s that the popularity that he had created about Cape Cod was changing Cape Cod. And, you know, the... Uh, more and more people were discovering Cape Cod and coming to see the place that he'd written about. Uh, he worried about it and he wrote in 1935, he said, I am entirely in sympathy with any attempt to keep Cape Cod from being further commercialized. If people would only realize that what the worthwhile visitor to Cape Cod comes for is its individuality, its fine old simplicity and its natural beauty. There are dozens of Coney Islands and Revere beaches and the like. So far, there is only one Cape Cod, and it should be kept as one, as the one. So the tourists came, and they came as they have continued to come, and uh, swelled up the roads and the beaches, and uh, the commercial side of Cape Cod worried him very much. I'm not sure how he would feel if today he came back to see just how much more crowded we are now. Provincetown, of course, with its connection to the, um, the steamship Dorothy Bradford, which brought a lot of people who would then take the train from Provincetown to other parts on Cape Cod. He saw it, and he was concerned about it. And, um, I think in some of his later novels, he made reference to the fact of growth on Cape Cod. There's Dennisport, probably 1930-ish, eh, I'm guessing. By then, Lincoln um, was uh, a celebrated writer, and he was certainly uh, the equal of other writers of his time, but he was a regional writer, and sometimes you might wonder, or we might wonder, why he's not 
studied in American literature courses in college. I think there are some reasons for that. I think his plots were very simple. Um, as I said, you kind of knew the outcome in the first chapter as to how it would all end out. But he did put a lot of plot twists that uh, kept you guessing, even if you knew that the bad guy wouldn't be successful. He also was a writer of his time, and uh, he was not averse to using some ethnic slurs that would have been common in writers from the beginning of the 20th century. I do think perhaps maybe in this age of uh, the trigger warnings, we might be, uh, there might be some students who would be offended by some of the language in Lincoln's books. Uh, maybe the most controversial book that he wrote was called The Portuguese, and it had to do with um, an old sea captain whose daughter married a Spanish man. And of course, that was not very liked by the old sea captain or the whole town that they grew up in. He should, she should have married a Cape Codder. Well, anyway, uh, she had a son, and uh, then she died, and so, and so had the father, so he was an orphan. So the old sea captain had to uh, adopt him. And uh, this young man, um, it was difficult for him because he was a person of color, which uh, really was you know, a difficult situation in these small towns. But he did prove himself in a lot of ways as an honest and hardworking young man, and he also served in the army in World War I. And so I think that was Lincoln's way of kind of showing that, you know, there is a change and that change can be uh, accommodated and even welcomed. And I think the Portuguese was um, a book, it was kind of a turning point for Lincoln. There's the Dennisport crowd, um, the campers in Cottage Grove. I used to say about these people as they came down with a clean shirt and a $20 bill and at the end of the week they hadn't changed either one. <laughs> This is uh, Lincoln uh, with Elmer Kroll. Elmer Kroll, the uh, wood uh, carver who carved all the decoys that uh, you can't afford today. But uh, Lincoln wrote a book of, that featured a very thin uh, character, a thinly drawn character. Queer Judson was the name of the story, a fellow who uh, didn't have success in the city but came back to True Met, and there he started carving birds and had a successful life. And if you haven't visited the uh, Elmer Kroll um, workshop, which is on the grounds of the Brooks Academy in Howard's Port, or Howard Center, you should go down. They've done a really nice job. So he knew these people, and he portrayed them. Again, never really gave them the names, but people were pretty sure they could pick out who he was talking about. His last book was written uh, during World War II. He was 73 at the time, and The Bradshaws of Harness was the last one. And it featured uh, an old Cape Cod family whose son went into the Air Force and was away, and they were having trouble with their business because um, the New York store had opened across the street and was undercutting the prices and uh, these, this local family didn't know how to compete. But there was a girl in the town. She was a local girl, I think her last name was Chase. And she came in and she straightened up the books, put out a merchandising campaign and made that little local store successful and eventually drove the New York store right out of business. And of course, she was there when the fellow got out of the Air Force and came back and they married. So that's a sweet story, typical of Lincoln. So his life from 1870 to 1944 was full of adventures, travel. Uh, he was celebrated, uh, certainly in this area, but nationally, he had a following. And um, that following continued uh, even after his death, probably up until maybe the late 1950s. And today it's sad that, you know, if I mention Lincoln in a general audience, people probably would not really know who he was. And we should remember him as uh, really the Cape's most prolific writer, and perhaps in a lot of ways the most interesting writer, because he wrote of a period of time that we don't live in, and yet he captured that simplicity of rural life, uh, traditional values, um, a way that certainly 
is lost, and uh, that alone is worth reading him. He really captured the Cape Cod that Patty Page was trying to sing about in her song about old Cape Cod, and that's another reason why I hope you take one of these books so that you can kind of go back in time and to that little cocoon of the late 19th century, early 20th century, and, and read about these characters. Uh, they're rich, they're interesting, and they'll make you smile. And the last picture is the picture of the Joe Lincoln birthplace home. This is a postcard from the 1950s, and it was taken when I lived there, because I grew up in this house. And um, I don't think it was taken because I lived there, but um, I remember a lot of people when I was in elementary school would come up in the summertime and they'd want to take a picture of the house and I'd go out thinking they wanted me in it, but they'd always, <laughs> out of the way, out of the way. And there's some, some interesting things about Lincoln and me. And that is, I grew up in this house. Uh, when Lincoln lived there, um, the town had less than a thousand people. Uh, there was a railroad that went through the town. Uh, it didn't have a bank. It didn't have a pharmacy. It, uh, you know, had one, maybe two general stores. And it had a little school that was really small and antiquated. When I lived there, it was the same thing. The town had less than a thousand people. The railroad still went through, but only carried freight. Um, and there was no uh, pharmacy, there was no bank. The school was an old wooden building that had been there for a long time. Uh, Lincoln was an only child, and I was an only child. And Lincoln's mother was really the key to setting his value system. And I have to say that my mother was the strong character in my parental guidance. They, she was the one that set the rules and, um, you know, I, I was very much influenced by her. Um, you know, he went to school a half mile away and probably walked or rode his bicycle. I did the same thing for eight years uh, of elementary school. Uh, the harbor was still there. Actually, the remnants of the old wharf were still there when I was a youngster. Um, we had some interesting connections, almost an eerie source, because Lincoln died in Winter Haven, Florida on February 13, 1944. I was born two weeks later, March 27, 1944. And I lived in that house, and somehow I think that um, I absorbed some things from Joe Lincoln. I've always enjoyed writing, and I've come to admire Lincoln much more in the past few years because Lincoln wrote 40 novels. I've written one, and it's going to be here next week. And it took me five years, and I have no idea whether it'll have any success like Joe Lincoln, but you know, after seeing that he would write one every year, I don't think there'll be another one after the one I've done. <laughs> so. I want you to uh, leave here with a, uh, a thought of maybe investigating Lincoln and his time, uh, realizing that uh, he did capture a part of Cape Cod that's gone. And again, please, I don't want to take any of these books home. I'm hoping they'll each grab one, just take one with you and have some fun reading it. So with that, um, I guess we can put the lights back on, watch your eyes so that you don't uh, you know, get them uh, startled by the light when it comes on. And I'm not sure, there might be some questions. We'll probably have a little time for the questions. I haven't looked at the clock. Pretty close. Yes? Those early movies of Lincoln's novels, are they available anywhere? I imagine you could probably get them. They were uh, silent pictures, yeah. and there were four of them. And uh, I imagine if you did a Google search, you'd find out where they must be in some archive. Uh, I don't offhand know where you could get them. I will say that the Chatham Historical Society is really the center of Lincoln memorabilia. Uh, a lot of his uh, original yellow notepads are there. Uh, a lot of the background of Lincoln and Brett are in the Chatham Atwood House, uh, the Historical Society. And so you might just make a phone call to the society down there and ask them because you could probably, they would steer you in the right direction. Yes. Yes, The Golden Boys. And uh, I liked it, but I may have been the only one. I liked it. I mean, it had Rip Torn, it had uh, Mariel Hemingway, 
Bruce Dern, who's, I think he's a great actor, and uh, who's the other guy that was in there? Was it, uh, yeah, well, Richard Dreyfuss was in another one. He was in the one about the lighthouse keeper. But um, let's see, Rip Torn and David Carradine, I think. So it was a fun movie. I don't think it uh, got too much in the way of rave reviews, but I liked it, and I hope you did too. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks an awful lot. You've been a great audience. Appreciate it. Make sure you come up and get a book. <laughs>